do on your Appendix B, the filling out of the chart? Can anybody get some time to do that over the last week? <laughs> it's a good, good little, remind, or little review of each of the four covenants we've covered so far. And remember what the four covenants are? What's one? In the Garden of Eden, before sin entered. Two? Adam and Eve. Three? Noah. And four? Abraham. Yeah. It's interesting how this is working out just like a brief overview of the history of the Old Testament, brief overview of the history of the, of the Israelites and their, their becoming a nation. And we'll continue that on next week. So, in the past sessions, we've looked at the agreements between Jehovah Elohim and mankind. The first covenant was before sin and rebellion entered the Garden of Eden. Second covenant was with Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve as they were removed from this perfect garden. Next, we visited Noah's time and saw the utter destruction of the world by flood. Even here, God gave certain promises and his protection as a small group of people started over. Then we looked at the incredible blessings, incredible promises given to Abraham, the father of the faith, to be a blessing to all people. In this session, we will discuss the covenant between the great I Am that I Am and Moses. Later, we'll look at his covenant with Joshua as God establishes and grows the nation. Capital B, background to covenant five. So this is the fifth covenant that we're, we're talking about. Much has happened in the 430 years after Jehovah called Abram into the land of Canaan and established faith as the foundation for all covenants and the entry of Moses into the promised land. So we lay, left off with Abram going into uh, the, his, into the Canaan land and all the struggles with his son Isaac, with, uh, with um, the next generation, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. That's where we last left them. 430 years later, God calls Moses. So we've got 400 years, 430 years time span. One in Abraham's life, lifetime. Because of Abraham and Sarah's impatience, a slave-born son, Ishmael, was born to Hagar, beginning a bitter rivalry between Hebrew and Arab, lasting 4,000 years right up till today. Abraham thus became the father of the Arab nation as part of his covenant and as many offspring as the sand on the seashore. Remember, that's what God told Abraham, that he would give him as many, off, as many uh, offspring as the sand on the seashore. So not only was he the father of the Arab nations, but also the fa father of the Israelite nations as well. We talked a little bit about that last week, how that's the rivalry between Ishmael and uh, Jacob continues on till today. Then Isaac, so the, the, the true-born offspring, the son of promise, was born to Sarah, thus beginning the Hebrew bloodline. Isaac's sons Esau and Jacob were born, causing the rivalry between the Hebrews and the Edomites. And again, that's part of the problem there today as well. Jacob, now called Israel, fathers 12 sons and one daughter and becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, thus starting the Hebrew nation. Sarah dies and is buried, and then later Abraham dies in Genesis 25, 7 to 10. Lifetime. And capital B is Covenant 5, if you didn't get that one. Yeah, that one? So, yep, number one, Abraham's lifetime. Then, number two, after Abraham, the twelve sons of Israel grew, married, and produced twelve tribes. That actually reminds me of a joke that I remember one of my, my year, year seven students said. You know, why did it take them 40 years in the wilderness? Because they were children, the children of Israel. So children took a long time to get where they were going. 
And ever since then, I've sort of watched the way that I say it. I don't call them the children of Israel anymore because that implies that they were children on the journey because they were grown-up men and women. So the twelve sons grew, married, and produced twelve tribes. Out of jealousy and anger, Joseph, the beloved son of Rachel in Israel, is sold into slavery to Egypt, jailed, and later released. Of famine in Canaan, the family travels to Egypt, reunited with Joseph, now the regent of Egypt and co-ruler of Pharaoh. Years go by, and under a new Pharaoh, the Israelites are made slaves. So they began with the 70 people in Joseph's day, so that would have been um, all the 12 brothers and however many wives and children they had at that point. But they began with 70 people in Joseph's day, to what history says between two to three million in Moses' day. So Israel grew into a great nation, but at that point they were a great nation of slaves. So that's an incredible reproduction rate in the 430 years, approximately that many years, to grow, grow from 70 people into two to three million people. Pretty an amazing blessing on, uh, by God on Israel. And the twelves. Now, number three, Moses enters the scene. God raises up Moses, born of Israelite parents, yet educated in Pharaoh's household. Moses is called to ministry, given supernatural anointing, and sent to Egypt to set Israel free from slavery so that they may worship their God. And as we know the story, Pharaoh refuses. Ten plagues later, the Passover celebration marks the end of their slavery. Moses and the two to three million people depart for the promised land. And that brings us up to the covenant that we're talking about tonight. So it's quite an amazing history. It's most of us that have grown up in, in, in the church know a lot of these stories from you know, just reading from Sunday school. So that's a, an overview of the history between when we left off with Abraham all the way up to the beginning with Moses. Any comments or questions on any of that? Then let's go on. See, understanding the Mosaic Covenant, or the Covenant with Moses. M-O-S-A-I-C. Mosaic Covenant. This is called the Schoolmaster Covenant. So the Schoolmaster Covenant was made on Mount Sinai between Jehovah and Moses. It was one of the most in, it is one of the most intricate, complicated, and difficult pacts ever given by God. Part of Jehovah's purpose was to show Israel and all mankind that sinful man could never even begin to meet his holy, perfect requirements, except through his way, and that's having that's the way of Jesus. So one of the reasons why the covenant was called the schoolmaster covenant was to show people, nations, and people after that, that no way could human beings ever begin to keep the covenant, the absolute perfection that God wants people to, to keep. We can't do it. We need His grace. There is nothing we can do to earn that place beside Jehovah through our own good works. Therefore, the law versus great debate is forever answered in Jesus. So this is one of the greatest object lessons that came out of the the law that was given through, through um, Moses is that human beings can't keep the law. It just is impossible. Now, why would that be? Why couldn't they keep the law back there? Because their heart wasn't changed. So what the law did was appeal to per acting perfect on the outside. And human beings are good at that and becoming very legalistic, very um, tied into to rules and, and uh, conditions to meet people's approval. But God said that wasn't going to work because the heart wasn't changed through all of that. And that's the amazing thing about the new covenant that comes with Jesus is because that's what Jesus can do is touch the heart. So law versus grace. And sometimes we think that that's the, the uh, argument that some people get in today, but you could go all the way back to the, to the Moses time and talk about law, because that's what Moses brought, absolute, final, perf perfect law. And it was written in so many different ways. 
but yet because the heart wasn't changed, they couldn't keep the law. This covenant includes the moral laws, the Ten Commandments, civil laws, regulation on health and hygiene, food laws, and a long list of ceremonial laws on the feasts, the building and the running of the tabernacle, the duties for the priests, general rules about the worship and service of Jehovah. Number one, who made the covenant and why? So who made the covenant? God made this covenant as a sovereign with a sovereignly chosen Hebrew people. They were to be the ones redeemed and adopted into a special relationship with him. How about, let's slow down and look at some of these verses. Somebody grab the one in Exodus. Someone get Deuteronomy 4, 22, 37. And someone else, Deuteronomy 7, 3 to 8. Exodus 2.25. It's coming. It really is. Mm -hmm. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So he chose the Israelites. So God looked on them and was concerned about them. Deuteronomy 4, 22. So I must go here and die on this side of the Jordan, that you will cross the river and take the land. Always remember the agreement that the Lord your God made with you, and don't make an idol of any shape or form. The Lord will be angry if you worship any other God, and he will be like a fire destroying everything in its path. Soon you will cross the Jordan River and settle in the land, and then in the years to come you will have children, and they will give you grandchildren. Yet, after many years you might lose your sense of right and wrong and make idols, even though the Lord your God hates them. So I am giving you fair warning today. I call the earth and the sky as witnesses. If you make any idol, the Lord will be angry and you won't live long, because the Lord will let you be wiped out. 37. Only a few of you will survive, and the Lord will force you to leave the land and scatter you among the nations, and you will have worship God's made of wood and stone, and there will be nothing but idols that can't see or hear or eat or smell. In all your trouble, you will finally decide that you want to worship only the Lord, and if you turn back to him and obey him completely, he will again be your God. The Lord, your God, will have mercy. He won't destroy you or desert you. The Lord will remember his promises and he will keep the agreement he made with your ancestors. When the Lord, your God, brought you out of Egypt, you saw how he fought for you and showed his great power by performing terrifying miracles. You became his people and at Mount Sinai you heard him talking to you out of fiery flames and yet you are still alive. Has everything, has anything like this ever happened since the time God created humans? No matter where you go, who you ask, you will get the same answer. No one has ever heard of another God even trying to do such things as the Lord your God has done for you. The Lord wants you to know that he is the only true God and he wants you to obey him. That is why he lets you see the mighty miracles and fierce fire on earth and why you heard his voice from the fire and from the sky. The Lord loved your ancestors and decided that you would be his people. So the Lord has his, used his great power to bring you out of Egypt. Hmm. That's a, a good foundation verse for the whole covenant. Mm -hmm. And 7, 6 to 8. We are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for yourself a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor chose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all the people. But because the Lord loves you, and because he has kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, 
The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Two, eight. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. Mm -hmm. Good verses. So the covenant is made with, as a fulfillment and a completion of God's irrevocable pact with Abraham. So irrevocable means what? Remember when we talked about revocable and irrevocable? That we, that no matter what mankind does, God doesn't change his pact. So it's irrevocable. <coughs> God fulfilled the conditions of, the, of, the Abrahamic, of Abraham's covenant regardless of mon, man's response or obedient. Some parts of the Mosaic covenant, however, are temporal, pointing to the eventual fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. The later covenant with, Joseph, with Joshua from Deuteronomy 27, 28 to 30 added the provisions for conquering and keeping the land of, of promise. Now this was an irrevocable covenant. So if Israel didn't keep the conditions, what would happen to them? They would, would be kicked out of the land. Yes. So that was a revocable covenant with Joshua. It was conditional as perseverance and obedience are the only way to receive his blessings in the here and now. And of course this is the same for the new covenant believers. The precondition for continuing to live in the promised land was obedience. And basically obedience when it came to idolatry, obedience when it came to the Sabbath day rest, Obedience when it came to conquering and preserving uh, the land, chasing out their enemies, and being true to God. Two, the words of the covenant with Moses. The words of the covenant with Moses. Holiness is an integral part of this covenant, influencing both the stated blessings for obedience and the curses for not keeping the whole of the law. There are three major categories of law in this covenant. Number one, the moral law. So that's the Ten Commandments setting out God's, the God-given measuring stick. They're the righteous standards for conduct in all relationships, both with God and with man. So the moral law basically was the Ten Commandments. The civil laws, a variety of regulations governing the civil, social, economical, personal, and legal aspects of living. There were regulations on health, hygiene, food laws, plus listing the punishments for breaking the laws. And it's recorded in Exodus 21 to 23. Now remember, this is the people that had been in Egypt. So they had a lot of the, the um, ways, the Egyptian ways of food preparation, of cleanliness, of diet. And so when God took them out of Egypt and started them throughout through the wilderness... Can you imagine what it would have been like for two to three million people on the march, on the move? They couldn't stop at a campground, couldn't stop and have showers, they couldn't stop and have their meat um, killed and, and dressed and taken care of in a very sanitary butcher shop. It just wasn't there. So one of the things in, in the 40 days, the 40 years in the wilderness was that God was showing them how he wanted him, the, the people, to live as far as food laws, the clean and unclean animals, as far as sacrifices, as far as um, all the, the moral and legal laws that he wanted his people to follow. So it was very comprehensive what God did for him in the wilderness. Thirdly, a long list of ceremonial laws on celebrations and feasts, building and running the tabernacle. Also requirements on tithing, duties for the priest, sacrifices, general rules about worship and about God's sanctuary. So there was a huge long list that the priests had to, had to know. What kind of animals went for what kind of sin? What kind of tithing needed to be collected? What kind of offering? And it went on and on and on and on. And then all the regulations for building the tabernacle. Because up to that point, how had they known God up to that point? Where was God for them? 
in the cloud that followed them by day and the pillar of fire that, that was with them by night. And that was where they were. And that must have been amazing to get up in the morning and go out and have a look at God. There he is, this huge cloud that was, fall, was over them and protecting them. So up until he, until Jehovah gave Moses the regulations for building the tent, the big tabernacle, God dwelt out there. But when Moses built the tabernacle, again, that must have been an amazing sight when this cloud moved and came in and dwelt inside the tabernacle. And for the first time, God the Creator dwelt with human beings. That must have just been totally awesome to see that happen. So that was what the third list was of all the the general rules about sacrifices and tithing and how to build the the tabernacle and who could serve and who the Levites were and establishing all the priesthood lines. So it was a huge, big um, covenant that God made with Moses and then with the people because of that. The conditions, number three, the conditions or terms of the covenant. Israel would receive the promises of Abraham covenant plus other blessings and the major word was if. And so it shows that this was a conditional covenant. So Israel would, would receive all the blessings that God promised to Abraham way, way, way back those 430 years earlier when God told Abraham he would give him the land that he was in and that was the Canaan land. If. Big word for two little letters. And of course, did Israel keep it? Were they true? No. Time after time after time down through the history. And we'll see that Next week, when we look at David's covenant, time after time down through history, they broke the covenants. Capital D, other parts to the covenant. No oath is recorded with this covenant. The agreement was recorded in the book of the covenant, according to Exodus 24, 7, and later written down into the book that we now call Exodus. The sacrifice, number one, the sacrifice to ratify the agreement. Rat I Fi the agreement. The people agreed with the conditions and sealed it by observing a covenant meal, eaten by their representatives in the presence of God. So they chose people and they sat down and had a feast to celebrate the, the signing of the covenant. Sacrificial blood was sprinkled on the people and on the altar to unite them in their agreement. So Moses went around after they'd, they'd actually sacrificed the animals and sprinkled blood on the people and on the, the, the agreement. So again, it was binding by the blood. The sacrifices included a, comp, a comp, complicated set of voluntary offerings. And there was a burnt offering, a meal offering, and a peace offering. And then there were other offerings that were compulsory. A sin offering, a trespass offering. Then further cleansing offerings were given for leprosy, for personal and family sacrifice, festivals, and Sabbath day sacrifices with clean animals. So it was a huge long list of what could be sacrificed and for what. And I'm sure, like, like all of us, we are very glad that all of that was met in what Jesus did for us. So he became the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, uh, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the festival offerings, all the different sacrifices uh, were met in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And it's interesting, if you're into types and shadows, to go back and see what each one of those offerings actually did, why they were put in place and what they required, and then to see how that was met in Jesus and what he did. 100% complete. So that huge long list of sacrifices that the people had to do was set in place with Moses' covenant. Any questions on any of that? Offering. A, sorry? Offering, yeah. Yes, um, actually you probably have to go back and look at, at why it was. I'm not familiar with why it was. But... It would have been different from the sin offering and from the other voluntary offerings. Probably if one person trespassed. So you'd have to go back and have a look in Deuteronomy, Exodus, and Leviticus would be the place to look for that. 
The seal of the covenant. Joshua gave the weekly Sabbaths to the Israelites as a sign of their covenant relationship with him. So one of the things that Jehovah said to Moses is that he wants one day in seven to do what? What were they supposed to do with that one day in seven? To rest, but basically to worship the Lord, to spend time with God, with Jehovah. And of course, by the time Jesus came along, they had so finely written out that whole law that one of the biggest biggest run-ins that Jesus had with the scribes and the Pharisees was just over what was work and what wasn't work. And they really took him to task many times because he healed on the Sabbath day or he helped someone on the Sabbath day. So Jesus began to, Jesus said that he was Lord of the Sabbath. So it wasn't so much the, the every last little tiny bit of the law that kept people from doing good on the Sabbath, but the Sabbath day was made to do good on. The Sabbath day was made for man. So that was a, to start with, that's exactly what God wanted him to do. Just take one day in seven and totally, completely rest and spend that time worshiping him, following him, probably having good relationships at home, gave a chance for parents to stop work and have some relationship with children and with each other. So it was very important to set one day in seven, and that was the seal of the Mosaic Covenant. The mediator of the covenant, number three, the mediator. Moses and Aaron were chosen to mediate. Later, later Joshua take, took the mediator's place in leading the people. And then when the priesthood was established and Aaron died, then the next high priest stepped in and the Levites took over that role. The place, number four, the place of the covenant. The holy place was the camp at the foot of Mount Sinai. Every day they gazed with fear and trembling at the cloud covering the mountain. The cloud signified God coming down and speaking to them. Through Moses' instructions, they provided material to build a complex tent or tabernacle for Jehovah to dwell in, patterned after the heavenly tabernacle. And again, if you're into types and shadows, it's really interesting to do a a bit of a study on how the tabernacle was laid out with the, the Holy of Holies and each of the different parts, different equipment, different pieces of the furniture that was put in the tabernacle and what that signifies for us today as New, Test- as New Testament believers. On the day it was finally completed, they watched as the cloud, the glory of Jehovah filled the tent. Amazing, the Lord God of creation had come to dwell with his people. Then E, the results of the covenant with Moses. E, the results of the covenant with Moses. The covenant with Moses did not annul or replace the promises given to Abraham. In fact, it ran parallel, even added to the previous arrangement with God. They flowed together and coexisted side by side. So there's nothing in the, co- in the covenant made with Moses that contradicts what God had said with Abraham. They were added on to, the, the, the covenant with Moses was added on to and fulfilled the promises that were given to Abraham. The people were also given new insights into the God of creation. He would become their all-powerful God, the one who stands against and delivers his people from their enemies. He is also a caring God who is deeply touched by the inhumane treatment of his creature, creation, his creatures. He is a forgiving, long-suffering, and patient God who longs for the restoration of his people to himself. So again, one of the things we can see out of each of the covenants is the new insights as to who Jehovah was, the new revelations of his personality. And certainly over the, the 430 years and then on into David's covenant, God's patience has just gone on and on and on and on and on. He is also an orderly God who rules his people as a way of protecting them from their enemies. He's a passionate God, rejecting apathetic, half-hearted worship. He has clear insights on the idolatrous heart of mankind, knowing the results of sin and our destructive tendencies. So God, not only have we seen more of God through each of the covenants, but it's like a progressive revelation of human beings as well. So from the the age of innocence with before Adam and Eve fell, the age of conscience, and now we've gone down to the age of law. It's like 
human beings have proven again and again and again that they're incapable of keeping the perf- perfect standards that God has for us. And that's why we need His grace. Conclusion. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfills the covenant with Moses perfectly, transferring the priestly functions of Aaron into the new covenant. He fulfills and abolishes the whole ceremonial and sacrificial system by his work on the cross. He brings us the righteousness that is not from outward works, but out of a changed inner heart. Christ's law of love, written on our hearts, enables us to live the life that is pleasing to God, one that walks not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So there are many correlations between the law of Moses and the the covenant made with Moses that translates into the new covenant. So it goes from a a physical, legalistic covenant where human beings were expected to keep This is probably one of the most, like I've already said, one of the most complicated, intricate covenants, the law, when the law was given to Moses and that he gave to the children of Israel. Because it it was a foundation covenant that helped them as a nation begin to understand exactly what he required of them. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So how do you determine what's continuous from one covenant to the next and what's revocable and what's irrevocable? Mm-hmm. Probably by seeing all the covenants together, because it's only us, as we that are standing this side of all the, the covenants where we can just lay out all nine of them and put them on the table and see, okay, this transfers to this, that transfers to this, that transfers to this. So we have the benefit of hindsight, for one thing. Secondly, some of the major, major themes that continue throughout each of the covenants show that it's a, a continuous built-on covenant. So the theme of the need for, for an animal dying, the need for blood, the need for payment for, for sin and guilt, that's one that's a theme that just goes through all of them and met in Jesus. Um, the, the theme of, um, of holiness that started out way back, of course, with Adam and Eve. That's exactly what got him in trouble. So that's another theme. So by looking at the themes, you can see what God builds on for the next covenant. As far as revocable and irrevocable, again, history shows us that, that one way we know that the covenant with, with Moses, or particularly probably more the covenant with Joshua into the promised land, was revocable because after so many hundreds of years, what happened? Israel broke up one too many times and they were sent into exile. So there's actual seven major cycles in Israel's history where on the seventh time God said, enough is enough is enough. And two tribes, the two tribes of Judah went into captivity to Assyria and the ten tribes of Israel went into Babylon. Or was it the other way around? Anyhow, that's where they did go. God kept um, releasing when they were crying out for mm-hmm. relief, and then as soon as they got relief, they went back into sin, and it was just a cycle. Mm-hmm. Yep. And yet they never really learned. Yep. And it's amazing how they were crying out to be free from Egypt, and yet they complained so much that they never got to the promised land. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. Think, I think they were better off staying where they were, mm-hmm. because they didn't know what going. Yeah. And well, it's just really sad. Mm. Except that, that we really need to be careful because a lot of that is transferred right to us. Because mm-hmm. it was their complaining, their unbelief that kept them out of their promised land. Mm-hmm. And certainly in counseling sessions, how many people are kept out of the, the fulfillment that, that God wants in their life by their doubt and unbelief. Mm-hmm. And just not being able to get their faith in motion and, and looking at emotions. And so they go up and down and up and down and up and down. And that's exactly what the human heart does until God can get in there. Yes? I, I think it's interesting in the, in the passage that I read that mm-hmm. Christ prophesied that. Mm-hmm. So he knew that their hearts weren't changed. Yes. He knew yeah. that the promised land wouldn't make them. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. And certainly Moses and his dealings with Israel had, had, you know, just been so exasperated so many times that when, when God told him to speak to the rock, he did what to it? He struck it. And the rock being a type of, of, of Christ, um, because of Moses' angry disobedience, that's what kept him out of the promised land. So Moses didn't get to see the promised land. He saw it from the top of the mountain. He could see across the valleys and see it. But Moses himself could not go into the promised land. Well, it's understandable. He got so frustrated. He just had enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He thought, forget this. I'll just bang it. Yes. <laughs> but I can understand that. Oh, the stuff, stiff-necked, rebellious people. But then that's all of us human beings. You know, until the heart's really changed, we are a stiff-necked, rebellious people. And that's why it's so important that the heart stuff happen, that it get out of just head stuff, even religion, get out of head stuff, just religion, and let it get down to heart stuff, or we're not changed, and we're really no different from them. If you had to pack up and, and go with the whole of Victoria out in the middle of the desert, you know, you'd be pretty hungry for your showers, you'd be hungry for your mac- mac- mackles, you'd be hungry for chocolate, you'd be hungry for... The leeks and the garlics of Egypt, and that's what they were. And they grumbled and complained, and, and of course that's what kept them out of the, the promised land. And they had to wander for 40 years rather than 40 days, because evidently the journey into the promised land was just 40 days. So in a little over a month they could have been into their promised land. But they were so rebellious and unbelieving and so hard-hearted that God couldn't let them go into the promised land because they weren't ready for it. So it was the next generation that got to go into it. So the next generation that grew up on the stories of grandfather and, you know, when it's your turn, you better do this. So all the lectures that the younger generation would have got helped them keep true to it. Mm -hmm. But God's patience is pretty amazing. His long-suffering. Now before we go into the second one, I found a really interesting book. And it's very um, evolution slanted. And it talks about, it's the, the atlas of the, the history of the earth. And it talks about, actually it shows some of the maps of, that they figure that the earth would have been like before, what we would say, before the flood happened. I don't know if you can see it very well. But yep, 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 that's the trouble with big books. But the, ma- the land continents, the mass of land, was basically all one continent. Mm, that's interesting. That, that started out. So that would have been back in the Garden of Eden days. And then the spread of human beings would have been very easy just to go on the, down the land mass. So when the flood started happening, then that's when I believe that the whole land mass started to separate and started to float apart to what we know it now. And it's still changing. Australia is moving however many many centimeters um, a year, floating which direction? Sorry? South. So, yep, we're headed to the Antarctic. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting. The other interesting thing, and... and um, it's, it's a bit strange that they made it so pornographic... But anyhow, they say that there's three, basic three different kinds of uh, different races. So that goes back to the three sons of Noah, as, as the Bible would have said. So one's the Negroid race, so all the African tribes and the dark-skinned people. The other race is what they call the Mongolians, so that would be all the Asian people. And then all the Caucasians, the white, whiter-skinned people. So according to the Atlas of, of History of the Earth, Three basic divisions of human, of the human race, which would go back to the three sons of Noah. So you're welcome to have a look at this. Again, I apologize for the pornographic na- nature of the pictures. I'm not quite sure why they did that. I've been tempted to go in and draw the little grass skirts. So, <laughs> so you're welcome tomorrow to have a look at that. Okay, we're just zooming ahead on this. So you're going to have to stop and answer some questions and get us sidetracked here a little bit. Just on that Noah part there, mm-hmm. how come, you know, they're so different? In other words, you know, how can you have a white man mm-hmm. have a black son you know, with, with no 
Yeah. Well, probably wasn't in in, Joe, in in Noah's generation that the three colors would have come through, or the three different races. It's as those three people groups started to spread. That um, according to evolution, if you live out in the desert and out in the hot tropic, the hot sun in the African desert for generation after generation after generation, what happens to the skin? It gets darker, and then that, that gets that's inherited down through the next generation. So if you're looking at it from an evolution standpoint, you know, thousands and thousands of years of the people living out in the, the uh, hot sun would produce dark-skinned people. However, if you're looking, if you're living in, in a country where you've got to keep protected because it's cold all the time, it produces fair-skinned people. So whether that's, whether that's the actual bi- biblical account of it, I, I would presume that, that it would have something to do with it for the generations to live in the different climates. But to start with, I don't think Noah had the three baby sons born of the three different groups of human beings. Mm. Actually, that's a really good question to ask when we do the creation-evolution debate. So we're not doing it the workshop with this unit, but the next unit is the challenges to the Christian faith. So we're going to talk about the cults, what the different cults believe, and in the different major religions of the world. And for the workshop of that session, we've got someone coming from the creationist, from the creation magazine, the, the um, what's it called, Gen- Genesis, and, and, thanks, Kate, Answers to Genesis. So they're going to bring a speaker, and we'll open that one up to the whole church congregation as well, and the whole community. So that's a really interesting question. If they don't cover that, that would be a good one to ask them, because they'd have a better answer than what I do. Mm-hmm. Good. Any other questions? Okay, the second section that we're talking about tonight is the Palestinian, or the Palestine Covenant. The Palestine Covenant. Now, this is our sixth covenant we're talking about. A bit of background for the sixth covenant. Moses, on behalf of Israel, made the law covenant with Jehovah. They had seen his miracles bringing them out of Egypt and along their journey. But did they trust him? No. In fact, that's what got them in trouble, their unbelief. So can you imagine getting up in the morning and having you know, your breakfast with the, the quail and the manna? You know, that would have been a miracle. And miracle after miracle after miracle God showed them. You know, the Egyptians drowning in the sea. The, the, their, evidently their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. Just amazing presence of God with them day after day after day after day. And they still grumbled and complained and couldn't go into the promised land because of their unbelief. And again, it's very easy to sit and shake our finger. They were terrible people back then. But so many of us, the doubt and unbelief in our own life is what robs us for going into our promised land with the Lord. So we can't judge them very harshly. Even during their, during their promises to obey, their heart longed for the food and the gods of Egypt. And where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. So their treasures were still back in Egypt. The lifestyle, the food, the, the, um, you know, just the traditions that, they were, that the Egyptians had taught them as they'd gone through their time of slavery. So their heart was still back in Egypt. The classic example of their lack of trust in God came at Kadesh Barnea, where the twelve spies brought back news of the marvelous land they had seen. Their report both encouraged and terrified the Israelites. Because of their evil hearts of unbelief, they were prohibited from entering the promised land. Remember the story that that, that uh, Joshua and Caleb came back with with. Evidently, it's samples of the grapes and samples of, of some of the things they could find in the Promised Land. But the other ten spies came back and said what? Giants, giants yes. And in, in, in their sight, we are but grasshoppers. And so the fear that the Israelites would have felt in that and not keeping the promise, well, God has kept us for 40 days and done so many miracles. He can do it. He can take us into the land. And that's basically what Joshua and Caleb said. But the other twelve, the other ten spies turned the whole people against the going into the promised land. 
Where is and what is the promised land? And what's the present day Israel? Right. And what about for us? And for us, the, the church and our relationship with God. That's our promised land. So going into what we've been spiritually promised. Right. Mm-hmm. Again, the, the types and shadows make fascinating study. And we'll get into a little bit of that when we talk about the new covenant with Jesus. Mm-hmm. So all the things that happen with them are examples to us today. Now, their report both encouraged and terrified the Israelites. Because of their evil hearts of belief, they were prohibited from entering the promised land at that time. This resulted in the desert wanderings, not for 40 days, the time it would have taken to get to the promised land, but for 40 years. Paul records this as a warning for us as well. Someone like to grab that verse in Hebrews 3 because it's a really interesting one. Hebrews 3, 7 to 11. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said that they will always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Mm -hmm. That's pretty heavy. That's pretty heavy. Mm. Yes. So God was just mildly displeased. No, he was very angry because again and again and again Israel just would not get their faith in motion. They chose to to uh, follow their fears, their unbelief, and so God didn't let them go into the promised land. This sixth covenant was made with Joshua in the land of Moab with the second generation out of Egypt. It was given at the end of the 40 years of Israel's wandering in the wilderness just before they entered the promised land. This covenant is a reaffirmation of the promises made to Abraham and to Moses. The Old Testament books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles deal with the fulfillment of these promises to enter the land. So Joshua, the book of Joshua, brings them up to the um, entering the promised land and then all the adventures with Joshua go on from there in Judges and Ruth and Samuel and so on. So it's a reaffirmation to Abraham. So again, it talks about the Israelites going into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It wasn't a land that we see you know, in pictures of Israel today and in Jerusalem today. You'd wonder why anybody would want to live there, let alone fight and die for it, because it's just a barren wasteland. But evidently before, back when we're talking about now, there were trees, the cedars of Lebanon covered the hills, and it was green and lush pasture. It was a very fertile land, very rich, wealthy land that God was giving them. He wasn't giving them just some little strip of desert out in the middle of nowhere. It was a very fertile land. B, understanding the Palestinian covenant. Understanding the covenant. Again, who made the covenant and why? Joshua, sorry, Jehovah planned to clean out the degenerate pagan practices of idolatry and child sacrifice from the land of Canaan and provide a holy land where the Messiah could bring in the covenant one day. So one of the reasons why God gave Israel the Canaanite land was what? What kind of people were the Canaanites by then? Totally degenerate. You know, they were into child sacrifice and, and all kinds of really horrific rituals to their gods and goddesses. The, the idolatry was, was you know, under every green tree and every leafy tree. It was just a very idolatrous, degenerate nation. And so one of the reasons God brought them back to the land of Canaan was because he wanted to clean out the idolatry that was there. And then secondly, to provide a land that was a, a stable, peaceful land so that he could bring the Messiah into the whole picture. The primary focus of this covenant is on Joshua, who had found favor with Jehovah, with Moses and the people as their military commander. This covenant laid out the conditions for entering and keeping the land of promise for all coming generations. Generations. 
And it was a conditional covenant. So it was one of those, if you do this, then I will do this. And I will do this if you do this. So it was a conditional covenant. The words of the covenant, in a very graphic way, the people were invited to choose their future. In the one side of the valley, so here Moses brought all the people into this huge valley. And on one side was one mountain, and on the other side was the other mountain. Now, how big the mountains were, you know, you'd probably have to go back and visit Mount Gazarium and Mount Ebal. They probably weren't very huge mountains because they still needed to be able to hear the words being spoken. But on one mountain, someone stood and gave all the blessings that Jehovah would give them if they obeyed his commandments. On the other side of the valley was Mount Ebal, where the curses were pronounced on them if they failed to keep the promises. So it was a very pictorial, very graphic way God was trying to say, look, it's as different as the mountains over here to the mountains over there. Depending on whether you keep my covenant, you'll be blessed. But if you don't, all the, co- the curses are going to result that were happening for him. So what you're saying there is that people had a choice to go to one mountain or the other, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was that graphic. So whether they actually were invited to take the journey and go up to one mountain or take the journey and go up one, the other mountain... But it was that graphic that they could see. On one hand are the blessings and on the other hand are the curses. Mm. Like a sign saying, blessings here and curses here. <laughs> 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 it must have been somehow that to mm-hmm. told them that uh, one was cursed and one was blessings. Yeah, because we're talking about two or three, well, the, the first generation was two or three million that came out of Egypt. So they probably would have been a, a fair bit more now. So a huge amount of people would have been gathering in the bottom of the in the valley. So there probably would have been some runners or whatever go throughout the, the people to say, well, this is what's being said, and this is the mountain that represents that, and that's the mountain that represents that. Because they certainly didn't have microphones or any sound systems back then. Mm. So it's a very graphic. God was very literal with them, very, very... Uh, uh, concrete in what he was saying to them. It was an airy-fairy sort of stuff. This time they responded in faith and obedience. So this generation, this is the second generation now out of Egypt, responded the way God wanted them to do. The blessings, the people were to prosper in the city, in the field, the fruitfulness, with daily provisions and daily activities, with victory over their enemies, with abundant storehouses, profitable labor, seasonable rains, national position, and to be blessed in commerce. So God pronounced a you know, huge long list of blessings over the people if they obey Him. And you'll find that huge long list in Deuteronomy 1.14. We won't read the whole thing. Some people have taken that as well. And uh, I don't know if any of you have read any books by Derek Prince. He takes a lot of the blessings and the cursings and applies that to the New Covenant, applies that to what Jesus has done for us today. And in the New Covenant, those are the blessings we can expect And the second part, the curses. These are the curses we can expect. If the people were disobedient, then disaster would overtake them. These curses were evident throughout the history of Israel, bringing the ultimate fulfillment during their captivity in Assyria and Babylon. So the curses were the exact exact opposite to the blessings. So instead of, of prospering in the city, they'd know failures in their city. They'd know failures in the field. They wouldn't have fruitfulness. The daily provisions would be very scarce. Their daily activities would be tedious and and, um, not, not interesting. They wouldn't have victory over their enemies. They wouldn't have abundant storehouses. They wouldn't have profitable labor. The rains would be withheld, and they'd be they'd be cursed in national position, and cursed in their commerce. And you can see throughout the history of Israel, every time they did fall away from Jehovah and the covenant that they had made with, with, uh, that God had made with David and Abraham and Moses, that's exactly what happened. They as a nation were cursed. They didn't prosper. They weren't fruitful. The, The rains were withheld and their storehouses were limited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Number three, the conditions or terms to keep. Jehovah reaffirmed that the promised land was his. Actually, someone like to grab those verses there because that's a really interesting concept, is that Canaan land was Jehovah's. So Leviticus 25, 23 to 24. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possessions you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, and if he redeems, if a redeeming relative comes to redeem it, that he may redeem what his brother sold. Mm -hmm. So part of, part of the covenant with Moses was that they could not sell the land. The land stayed in the tribe or in the family. They could like lease it out, depending on how near the, the year of Jubilee was happening. The year of Jubilee, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but that's every 50 years the land was to have rest and to return back to whoever owned it. So if you were the tribe of Benjamin, that land stayed with the tribe of Benjamin. It could never be sold outside of that. So at the 50-year Jubilee, it would return back to the family possession. Because, as, as uh, Maria read, the land was Jehovah's, the land was God. And they were only stewards in the land. They were only just to be the, the caretakers of the land. Jehovah then goes on to reaffirm the covenant with Joshua with three basic commands. Someone like to grab Deuteronomy 5, 1 to 4? Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. Mm -hmm. So this is the covenant. It had three basic things that God said. Number one, that they needed to keep the law. And this is the law that he gave Moses, especially the Ten Commandments. So they were told again to keep the Ten Commandments. Then they were to continue in their love, in their obedience to Him. Then they were to allow a rest time for the land. Every seventh year was to be a Sabbath year, and every fiftieth year was to be a Jubilee year. So every seventh year, the land was just to be left fallow, was just to be left unplanted, unplowed, and you couldn't grow anything in that seven years. Now, because what God intended was that the blessings would be so much there in the sixth year that there'd be plenty of provisions to live off of what was stored up for the seventh year. So can you imagine what it would have been like for you and your family? This is my Sabbath year. To not have to go out and work, to not have to go out and tend the harvest in the fields, it was a rest year every seventh year. Wouldn't that have been amazing? And then every 50th year was to be a jubilee, a jubilee year with special celebrations and special festivals and feasts. So God is not a stingy God. He's not a, well, you have to work 99% of your time and only 1% you can take off and do what you want. Now, one day out of seven, one year out of seven, and one year out of 50 was very, very special. So he was very generous with Israel. Their failure to keep the conditions would result in what? Expulsion. Expulsion from the land. So if they didn't take care of the promised land, God said they would lose it. They would be expelled. They would be kicked out. They would be chased out of the land of, I of Israel. And that's exactly what happened when they went into captivity. Now again, if you're into types and shadows, it's really interesting to go back and look at types and shadows for every seventh year. What we as the New Covenant believers are supposed to be doing because our year of rest is, is, ma is made in Jesus. So in resting in His promise, not only is that our Sabbath day rest, our seventh day rest, but also our once every seventh year rest. So some interesting types and shadows when you take the, the basic things that were given to Moses and transfer them into the New Covenant. Any comments on any of that? I comment on, on that uh, seven years. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to a farmer actually who, who mm -hmm. that still applies today actually because um, mm -hmm. that farmer's only farming the land for six years or whatever because after, after that time the land doesn't produce good crops anymore. Mm -hmm. 
they can change prop uh, um, areas mm -hmm. to a new property so it grows good fruit or vegetables again. Mm -hmm. So that started there and still going today. Yes, yes. So God knew what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they rota rotate the crops. Yeah, but that one one year out of seven was what God told him to leave the land fertile, un, unplowed and unproduced and nothing produced on it, which gives the, the land a chance to regenerate and, and get the nutrients back in the soil. Mm -hmm. So, yes, a lot of these... It's interesting, a lot of the farming practices Israel has gone back to when, they've come, when the, the Israelites have come back to the land, when the Jews have returned to their homeland and are starting to pick up some of the things that the the law told them to do, such as that. And they're finding great benefits with the, in the farming, changing the farming practices. So yes, some people have picked up on that and have gone back to the Old Testament and picked out a lot of those same rules, those same same principles and applied it today. And it's, it's, they're very prosperous because of it. Mm -hmm. So God must have known what he was talking about. Hmm. Any other comments? I was just wondering if, like, when you read Joshua, I don't know if anyone's going to tell you the number of people that are killed in that. Mm. How do you, um, how does that overcome with the need to keep the law of the Ten Commandments? Well, that's one of those, uh, Just I'll just repeat your question for the tape. You know, how do we balance the, the Ten Commandments of Thou Shalt Not Kill with all the people that were killed when they took over the Canaan land? Because they certainly did. They, they slaughtered whole families, men, women, children, animals, burnt the cities right down to the ground. So why would God tell them to do something like that? It was to cleanse the land. That's number one. Because even if they would have left, you know, even if they would have left some of the children alive and taken them into their tribe, the pollution that would have come in through those children would have pulled the Israelites away from from the purity of the Lord, they would have drifted into idolatry. With, with hornets and wasps, um, would actually he would remove the people from their houses so that the Israelites didn't have to kill anybody. They would have just left because of the, you know, the, the conditions in the land weren't, weren't good for them anymore. And that was God's plan. Remember, a lot of the things that happened in the Old Testament wasn't because God wanted it to happen that way. It's a record of what actually did happen. So, had Israel been able to be true to Jehovah, even there would have been probably some possibility of converting all the Canaanite nations around them to become good, holy people, and they wouldn't have need to have been killed. Now, some of, some of the, the um, killing that went on resulted to the greed for the gold, the greed to take over the, tro the town, to take over the possessions of the enemy. And some of it, whether God wanted that to happen or not, is questionable. But I suppose we can, we can you know, and I, I've had lots of people ask me that question, but God is God. And it wouldn't go over so big today. In fact, the ethnic cleansing that's happening in today's time is the world's up in arms about it. But because God was cleansing the land, he was purifying it because of all the horrible practices that the Canaanites were into. He didn't want the Canaanites to be left alive anymore. The other way to look at it is when it's talking about thou shalt not kill, it's talking about an Israelite killing an Israelite. Well, that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. protection for the tribe of the Israelites. Yes. And the other people just didn't come under the... Yes, didn't come under it, and God wanted the land purified. So basically, yes, it's Israelite not to kill Israelite. Mm -hmm. Because in Joshua, isn't it, there's somebody that took God and killed and hit it. Mm -hmm. the yes, Achan. Yes, he and his, his whole tribe and his whole family just vanished into the hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. So God didn't want them to take village after village and just hoard up all the gold and whatever. He didn't want them to pillage and and uh, do all the things the soldiers would have been good at. He didn't want that. That almost fits in with as a parent in the sense of people mm -hmm. when you protect your own mm -hmm. from the point of maybe having to kill somebody else. Yes, like a thief or a robber. Uh -huh. In that sense. 
And that yes. had the father, he protected his children. Yes, so for right. protection. And they get to a point, but you know, he, he can only protect them in the So when you come yeah. in, when you're protecting the Israelites, mm -hmm. the others don't come under that. But, yeah. But really, you can see that why. Right? Yeah. You can see why yeah. God did what he did. Yes. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? And how about let's break at this time and have a cuppa. Where did we get up to? Capital C. Other parts to the covenant. The sacrifice to ratify the agreement. So the sacrifice that they had. This is capital C. Other parts to the covenant. The sacrifice to ratify the agreement. The sacrifice followed the pattern given to Moses. They built an altar of unhewn stones. So these were stones that weren't cut by, by stone cutters or they were just pretty much just rocks that were the right size built into an altar. Here they offered the sacrifices of the burnt and the peace offerings to the Lord. The priests carried out the ceremonies in the body and the blood of the animals. So they actually had ceremonies for the blood in the body of the animals. The seal of the covenant. Moses was given the seal of the Sabbaths, both, the, both as feast days and the seventh day as a rest for the people, a time of focus on the goodness of their God. Under the Palestinian covenant, Jehovah was sorry, Joshua was required to keep a Sabbath rest for the land as well. Every seventh year and every fiftieth year the land was to be left unplowed. The land was also to be returned to original owners, the entrusted servants, stewards, and was never to pass out of the family and the tribe's care. So for Joshua, the, the seal of his covenant was that the land was to be given the Sabbath day, the Sabbath year's rest as well. So the seal with, with Moses was the seventh day, the Sabbath day rest. Now that brings all kinds of interesting questions of uh, the keeping of the Sabbath day for Christians today. And I don't want to get into it unless you want to talk about it, but it's, it's interesting that that was the seal given to Moses. It's not the seal given to the New Covenant, the New Testament with Jesus. Our seal is not the Sabbath day. So it's interesting. We're still to have a Sabbath day rest. In fact, if we go back to that verse in Hebrews, it talks about that there's still a Sabbath day left for the people of God. And that Sabbath day rest is our belief in Jesus. So we rest in Him. We rest, rest in His work. So that not, not, it's not so much keeping one out of seven days doing nothing. It's supposedly all seven days of the week are to be spent that way. So our whole week is to spend in that relationship with God where He's the total focus of our day. So it isn't so much keeping one day in seven with our covenant with Jesus as it is 24 hours, seven days a week. And it's resting from our own self-effort, our own works, by resting in what Jesus has done for us. So one of the things we'll discover when it comes to the new covenant is a lot of the things that were from each of the previous six covenants have been spiritualized. They've been taken into the spirit realm, into this trying to keep it by the Holy Spirit, rather than out of outward perfection and holiness. So in Jesus, not only is a lot of the conditional elements of the covenants done away with, but in Jesus, that's our seventh day rest is now in Jesus. So again, the types and the shadows that have to do with the new covenant compared to the old covenants. Any questions on that? Usually get some good discussion on whether we should be keeping the Sabbath day or not. Because the Sabbath day is Saturday, it's not Sunday. Well, didn't it change because when Christ rose on Sunday, isn't that the reason why? Mm -hmm. Jesus rose on Sunday in the early church and set aside the first day of the week. Now, for a long time, they also kept the Sabbath day ceremonies in the temples. Mm -hmm. In the, in the, um, you know, all the, all the, the, until the actual division came between the Jews and the Gentiles, a lot of the early Christian, the early Jewish Christians would have gone to the temple on Saturdays as well. And that's where they did a lot of their, their talking to the other people in, the, in their faith. When Paul asks the question of Peter, what should 
the Gentiles do mm -hmm. in order to fulfill and keep the law. Yes. I mean, basically, they, they basically come to an agreement saying they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Just don't eat blood. Um, Meat sacrificed to idols and watch their sexual impurity. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, yes. So then, so I'm a little delayed what's happening. I mean, <laughs> Well, the, the early church, when, when the apostles came together and talked with Paul about it, because Paul had, had, you know, all these amazing things were happening with the Gentiles that the Jewish believers found, you know, just unbelievable. That here the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles and they were speaking in tongues and miracles were happening and lives were being changed. So the Gentiles were starting to follow the way of the faith as well. So Paul goes back to, his, back to the apostles and says, hey, this is what's happening. And then this, this segment of the Jewish Christians started saying, yeah, but you need to teach them to keep the law, and you've got to keep them circumcised, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. And Paul said, hey, wait a minute, where's, where's, where's Jesus in all of this? Why did Jesus die if we had to make the Gentiles into the Jewish faith, into keeping the law? And so they had a big church council, and that's what they decided, that they didn't, the Gentiles didn't have to be circumcised, they needed to be careful of eating meat sacrificed to idols and not to eat the blood that was in the meat and to keep themselves sexually pure. Now, Paul goes off and begins to spread all this throughout the, the pagan, the uh, Gentile world, and they're very happy. They don't have to go through circumcision and do all the things that the Jewish believers once had to do. But behind the scenes, whether James, who seemed to be the one of the church elders at the time sort of caved in to the pressure groups coming and saying, hey, you know, you've got to get back to Paul, you've got to tell them they've got to be circumcised, they've got to keep the law or whatever. But that was an issue that just haunted Paul time after time after time after time, is the, the Jewish Christians who said, hey, you've got to be circumcised. And they got to Galatia, that's why he wrote the book of Galatians, you know, saying, I'm afraid for you, you've gone back to the the, the law, you've gone back to trying to perfect your, your behavior of doing good works to meet God's approval. So Paul was very much, every time he came back to Jerusalem, it's like he had to face that issue. And again, I think there's at least one other time where they make that agreement. And so Paul goes off and goes through the, all the, the Gentile believers and spreads the word and it's all great and everything's right until he comes back to Jerusalem again. And evidently for a while there's a, a small group of, of Jewish Christians or Jewish, uh, I don't know if you'd call them Christians or not by that time, that began to follow Paul around and began to stir up trouble for him wherever he was in, in, in lots of the different cities. And eventually that's why he, he was taken captive and went into Rome or was arrested and went into prison in Rome. But yes, that was the basic fundamental position that we didn't have to keep following circumcision. We didn't have to do all the Sabbath day rules. We didn't have to do all the law of Moses that the, the uh, early Jewish believers would have started out trying to do. And I'm sure we're all very thankful that we haven't. Because if, if we would have, then what good would Jesus have come? Why, why would he have come if we had to go back and keep the Old Testament law? So we don't have to. And I think it's probably a whole lot more about grace than what we have any idea and that a lot of times we do try to keep the outward perfection and you know, we're talking about going to church on Sunday twice on Sunday and five other times during the week and that's what good Christians do I don't think that's what God would say but we've made it very much a workspace but I think ever since Adam and Eve doing what they did you know because they first tried to sew fig leaves together or, or I don't know if they were fig leaves but big leaves together as their covering as their clothes and God said, no, I've got a different way. So right there, Adam and Eve had to choose between doing it their way or doing it God's way. And again, that's one of those themes that have come all the way down through every one of the covenants. Or are we going to choose to do it God's way or are we going to go do it self's way? And of course, that's the huge big division between the real people of God, the straight and narrow way, this, this narrow path that we're on compared to 90% of the world is walking down the other path. Because they don't want to do what God wants them to do. They want to do what they want to do because they want to do what they want to do. So that strain, that thread, the theme coming down, are we going to do it God's way or are we going to do it our way? Are we Are going to make up our own rules, our own regulations, or are we going to do what God wants us to do? Mm 
And I think it's a whole lot more about grace than we have any idea. That goes back once again in our time. We, we have the truth of the blessing. Mm-hmm. We have the knowledge of the curses. Yes. And from my own point of view, for many years, I was quite happy to accept the curses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I wasn't happy to take on the blessing. Mm-hmm. Yep, until you began to yeah. choose and see the difference. Yeah, I said before, there was so many fewer blessings to the number of curses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But even knowing that, you're still willing yeah. to take them on. Yeah. Rather than believe that the object of any truth. Yeah. So it's a lot today. Right? Mm. That's true. So it must have to do with the hardness and the, the blindness of the human heart. Still here today as much as it was way back there. Mm-hmm. That's true. So the seal of the covenant covenant with Joshua, it was for the land to have the rest as well as the people to have the rest. Upon obedience, Jehovah promised the early and the latter rains as a token of his covenant blessing. If Israel broke this covenant, God promised to withhold the rains from the land. And as we go through the history of Israel, evidently that happened many times when the people were taken into captivity that's one of the things that, that has brought the land of Israel to where it is today, was that the water, the rains were withheld. So once again, it's proving that Israel, that, that the land of Cain and the promised land, the land of Israel, is God's land. And he's watched over it. And I think he's still watching over it today, even with all the horrific um, struggles and battles that are going on in, in, that you see on the news every night. God's still concerned about Israel. He's still concerned about Jerusalem. It's where the Messiah is going to be coming back. So he wants, he, he's got an eye on Israel. It's not that he's forgiven, forgotten Israel and all the bloodshed that's happening right now. And of course, the, the types and shadows of the early and the latter rains. Joel talks about the rain being the, the rain of the Holy Spirit being poured out on all peoples in the end, end days. And that's where we're living is in the latter, latter years. And so we, we've tasted the latter rains. The early years were in the beginning with the church, and we're now into the latter rains. So that's why even there was a group called the Latter Rain Movement. I don't know if there was so much here in Australia, but part of the Pentecostal movement called themselves the Latter Rain Movement. It was very much Pentecostal-based group. So the early rains and the latter rains. We're in the latter rains. Three, the mediator of the covenant. After the deaths of the lawgiver mediator Moses and the atoning mediator Aaron, the priestly duties passed to Eleazar and then on to the Levites. So Moses was the mediator of his covenant that gave the law along with his brother Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest. Remember, he was the one that set up the structure of the, the priest system. God told him how to do that. So when Moses and Aaron died, the duties passed on to the, first, the next high priest, who was Eleazar, and then the tribe of the Levites. It's interesting, when they, the Levites went, when they went into the Promised Land, the Levites were not given a portion of the land. So the other 11 tribes were given parts of, of the Promised Land to conquer and to settle in. But the Levites were not. Why? They were they were holy for the Lord. So their duties was in the in the temple, in the priesthood, the sacrifice system, they actually took care of all the sacrifices. And they they spread out sometimes throughout history, households would have their own priest. So they'd have their own descendant of Levi that actually came into the household and performed a lot of the duties and the ceremonies. So they were to be a holy tribe unto the Lord. Now they were given tithes, so it wasn't that they had to go out and become beggars because they certainly weren't living in a temple system where the tenth of everything came into the priesthood. So they got the tenth of the best meat, they got the tenth of the bread, they got the tenth of flour and grain and oil and everything that Israel had, 10% went to the priesthood. So the Levites were very well taken care of. And supposedly that's a pattern for what today? Sorry? Tithing, Tithing for today? Yes, it's supposed to take care of who? Pastors. The pastors and the, the, the five-fold ministry peoples. Mm-hmm. The gifts that are given to the church today. Any comments on that? Yes. 
questions on that? Certainly there's, there's, um, there are times when that's not been, been fulfilled. There's been times when people haven't done that. There's been times when pastors have almost on the poverty line. But if we follow the principles from the Old Testament of taking care of the Levites, pastors should be living as comfortably as the rest of the flock is. Not over the top, nor should they be on the poverty line. So if you have 10 people giving 10% of their income, a pastor should be making the same wage as the members in the congregation. That's the system. It doesn't always work that way, but that's what the system was supposed to do. For the place of the covenant, the holy place, the land was Jehovah's sanctuary, his holy place. We need to grasp this fact to see the intense care and love the Creator gave to His chosen people and their entrance into His land. So God requir- God um, thinks of Israel as His land. So it be interesting to see His heart in what is happening there today. D, the results of the covenant, repeated violations brought consequences. History shows the repeated violation of this covenant, especially their their breaking covenant for the care of the land and for their repeated idolatry. These sins forced God to judge them repeatedly by withholding the rains and eventually removing them from the land altogether. And like we said, two two tribes, the, the tribes of Judah, went into captivity, and I think it was to Assyria, and the other ten went into Babylon into captivity, and they were there, I think, for 40 years, was it, Bible scholars? 70 years, 70 years. So they were there for 70 years, and then a remnant came back to the promised land. And that's on to the covenants that we will talk about next week. Two, Jehovah removes them from the land. All the 12 tribes were taken into captivity, as we will see in session 4, With the dispersion of Israel, the land itself became desolate. The early and the latter rains were not given for centuries. However, just as God is careful to restore a remnant to the land, His care of the land itself was and is being restored for the coming of the Messiah. One of the Bible prophecies that is in the middle of being fulfilled, it talks about Israel beginning to bloom um, what's the prophecy? Just trying to get it back. Something about being being starting to bloom in the desert, and a lot of the agriculture project projects that are happening in Israel. That's exactly what's happening. They're restoring the land back to the beautiful state it was in, and that's supposedly supposed to be happening before the Messiah comes back. So, what promise that holds for those who are looking for the second second coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ? and for the latter rain to hit their parched land. Number three, applied to Christians today. The natural language of these two covenants gives significant spiritual types and shadows to the new covenant church, such as, and I just went through and just picked out four, but there's a a long list of things of how this covenant applies to Jesus and to the new covenant. Since the fig leaf incident in Eden, mankind has been trying to reach God's standards and God's kingdom, but in our own way. The covenant of the law settles the issue. We are not capable of meeting God's holy standards in our own way. We need His grace. In fact, there's no way that we can begin to meet the standards that God has for us until we begin to let the Lord touch our heart. And once He works through heart issues and we get from the mind down into what's happening in our heart, then that's when the growth happens in every Christian's life. So the law issues, the, the being able to meet God's holy requirements on our own methods, we can't do it. Never capable of doing it unless the heart begins to be changed. All the types and shadows of Israel entering the land find applications in our own journey into our spiritual promised land, into the Holy Spirit. Their physical journey compares to our spiritual journey, conquering their enemy with our obedience to the Holy Spirit. It's a really interesting book called um, what is it? Giants and Grasshoppers, and it's based on what... what uh, 
the ten tribes said to Israel that the land is full of giants and we are but grasshoppers in their sight. And what the person has done is taken the, the enemies that Israel conquered or the enemies that they attempted to conquer because they always weren't successful and compare those to what they are in our own spiritual journey. So what are some of the biggest things that Christians struggle with? What keeps Christians defeated? Fear? Yes? And one of the tribes that Israel conquered is directly comparable to a Christian conquering fear in their own life. Mm -hmm. So he takes, I think it is the seven different battles that Israel had Um, And like I said, they didn't always conquer the way that God wanted them to. And they compare that to what it is in our own Christian life. So fear was one. Um, I think doubt and unbelief was another. Lust was another. Um, Pride, I think, was another. And then the flesh was another. And it was interesting to see the comparisons because they went back to the original names of the the the, uh, enemies that they conquered and how it compared to what Christians are doing today or not doing today. Because we each want to have our own promised land that we're entering, and that's our walk with the Holy Spirit. And the same sort of cycles that Israel goes through, there was, like Maria was saying, there was a time when, when Israel cried out to God because they were being oppressed by a foreign power, some sort of dictatorship, or um, such as the whatever the conquering army was. So they'd call out to God, and what would he do? He'd, he'd help them. He'd save them. He'd send them a judge. He'd send them a prophet. He'd send them someone. He'd send them a deliverer, and they had their salvation. And so they were very thankful, and they lived really good for a while. But then what happened? They went back to their sins. They went back to the idolatry. They went back to the fear. They went back to the doubt. They went back to whatever it was. And so that cycle just went round and round and round and round and round. Now that same cycles in our life. We get to a point where something is really bothering us, whether it's physical pain, emotional pain, the person next door, the guy at work, and we say, God, help me. How am I going to get over this? How can, I, how can I get my feet back on the ground? How can I get my victory? And so he sends us either a word or we get something from the Bible or somehow he helps us see what it is that we need to. And so we take that little bit of victory. Sometimes we get back up on top of the fear, the anger, whatever it is that we're trying to, to get over. And we do great for a while. But then what happens? If we're not careful, we can just fall right back into it again. And so those same cycles that Israel went through, the Christian often goes through as well. So the aim is to so let God deal with our heart stuff that the doubt and the unbelief is taken care of. And that no matter what comes against us, we will not fear. No matter what comes against us, we won't doubt. No matter what comes against us, we'll walk in the Spirit trying to keep it through. And that it's a level growth victory rather than an up and down and up and down and up and down. So some really interesting what's called types and shadows and what Israel went through that are compared for us today. The principles of rest and reign. The work of Jesus Christ has become our Sabbath rest. The church becomes his land. We enter his rest by cleans- by ceasing from our own attempts to work our way into God's favor. So we rest in what Jesus has done for us. We don't try to earn God's favor anymore. So that means then we have to know what Jesus did do for us. And that's the topic of number five session and what we're talking about of because I reckon that probably one of the biggest things that Christians today, why people, why Christians struggle with their faith is because they really don't know what it is that Jesus has done for them. So they don't know the promises. They don't know the blessings. They don't know what it is that God has provided for us in Jesus. So we get our eyes on the natural and we, we don't understand our inheritance that we have in Jesus. So that's what we'll be talking about in session five. So, we enter His rest by ceasing our own attempts to work out our way into God's favor. And certainly in the counseling room, that's what's happening time and time and time again. People are trying to live by this high measuring stick that they think they have to do in order for God to love them. So they have to earn His love. They have to, you know, just like they did with their natural father. If they weren't good, what would natural father do? 
they probably get a belting or told off or whatever. And so many people have just transferred that to Father God. And so he doesn't require us to keep the huge long list of commandments and ordinances and rules and regulations that we sometimes think he does because only Jesus could do that. So it's us stepping into what Jesus has done that brings us the salvation, not us trying to be really good on our own self because we can't do that. Comments on that? Because I see it's a, a real trap that a lot of people fall into. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying that so many people don't put themselves in Christ's dream. Mm-hmm. It's true. And don't really accept the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And that we're living in the time of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. And as you said before, in the early testament, you can relate to God. Yes. And you can relate to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now we're doing it. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's true. That's well said. That's very true. Yeah. So, our attempts to work our way into God's favor. Next one, unbelief and doubt keep us out of God's best also. Obedience brings growth and blessings instead of idolatry and disobedience. And probably for most people, the biggest growth happens when they start stepping under the lordship of Jesus and doing what the Lord is telling them to do rather than keeping all the, the laws and the rituals and the regulations, even of what our church tells us we ought to do, but to step under the Lordship of Jesus. Conclusion. Moses' covenant paints the picture of the growth, development, and discipline of God's covenant people, Israel. Following their captivity in and the release from Egypt, God plants them in a land flowing with milk and honey. In an ungrateful response to this shower of blessing, grumbling Israel runs after other gods, abandoning the God of their fathers. His next dealings with the people of Israel show a faithful God calling his people back to the Palestine Palestine covenant, covenantial relationship they had abandoned. God continues with his one great plan, the eternal design of the Almighty God to redeem a wrecked and ruined world. This is where we pick up next week with a covenant with David, the shepherd boy and coming king. So remember the whole aim of God right back from the start. He knew all of this was going to be happening. Didn't catch him by surprise when Adam and Eve did what they did. So his whole plan is how to bring mankind back to the relationship with him and still stay true to his holiness. And as I've said, that's where we pick up with David next week. Any comments? Then how about, we've got about five more minutes. <laughs> Appendix A, the last five covenants that we're going to be talking about. So on your other sheet, you got up to the covenant with, Mos- with Abraham. So covenant number five was with Moses. Yes, covenant six, Joshua. covenant with a person so who did the God make the new covenant with with Jesus that's right so it's the covenant made with Jesus of Nazareth who was the Christ the Messiah and then covenant number nine we haven't talked about that one either that one's coming up that's the everlasting covenant made with who's God make the everlasting covenant with The church, the bride, and that's throughout eternity. So that's the last one we'll be talking about is the eternal covenant, the one that we have yet to look forward to. That's some pretty good stuff in the eternal covenant. Okay, any other questions? No, you can't do the last two because we haven't done the last two yet. But you can... Where did it, did I lose you on the last one, or just needed to take time to? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, I had a feeling these ones are on the last one, and the last one. Okay. Well, what basically what you're after the first the first part of it's fairly easy. I 
Yeah. Yep. Well, then you need to go back. For example, if you go back to the one in, in Eden, the words of the promise. What were what was man promised if he if he would be faithful to God? Someone like to be fruitful, and multiply, to to subdue, to take over the whole earth was the promises, the curses. Now remember, some of them there wasn't any curses given. Okay, that would be the second one with Adam and Eve. So yeah, the second one's probably the easier one to do. But the first sacrifice, the first blood sacrifice in the Garden of Eden was what? No, this is before Cain and Abel. That's that's Adam and Eve. Before that, what when was blood shed with man before sin entered? This is a good trivial pursuit question. How did Eve get formed? Mm -hmm. So Adam's blood was shed, or his his rib was his body was cut, and there probably were would have been blood so that Eve could be formed. It's interesting that that uh, part of part of what I what one person said was that Adam made out of the dirt the dust of the ground. So most males are very earthy, very concrete, very practical, very much down to earth. But Eve was made out of what? Ribs. She was made out of the ribs. So she was one step more refined than Adam. <laughs> careful, careful, careful. Now the foundations for in the, the, the covenant in the Garden of Eden, how was that foundation set for the other covenant? Remember that was the first covenant that showed what God wanted for the whole of mankind. So what was set for the foundations was just God's purposes for the why He created mankind. It's to reign and to rule with Him. To um, fill the whole earth with His glory. To fill the whole earth with the thriving uh, population of God-blessed people. And the words and the promises to Adam, okay, the words of the covenant, he was given certain promises. Now this is after sin. So there's a lot of the, cur- the results of their breaking the law. That's the words of the covenant. Blood sacrifice, yes, that was the animal that God killed in order for the skins to be made for their clothes. Foundations for the next covenant gave you about six of them. One was just that the seed would come, the Messiah would come. Remember God told the serpent that the, the seed of the woman would crush his head. He'd bruise, bruise the seed's heel, but it crush his head. So the promise is for the Messiah that was to come. Then the relationships between males and females, we mentioned that one. Foundations for the next covenant. The sacrificial system. Then if you go on to Moses, or sorry, uh, Noah, what were the covenant words with between Noah and God? That he wouldn't ever flood the earth again, the rainbow. He promised that, that he would be with Noah. He wanted him again, Noah and his descendants, to have a, 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 a holy, perfect people. Blood sacrifice that Noah made a sacrifice, a thanksgiving offering, and the seal was the rainbow. So these are a, a chance for you just to have some summary for yourself and put it into your own words. And then the next one was the one with Abraham. And the seal of that was circumcision. Okay, any other questions? Then how about I pray for you? We'll see if we can get a little bit of time next week to catch up with the, the, um, your Appendix A on, on Moses, Joshua, and David. Because next week it's just David's covenant. It's not trying to do two covenants in that one. Okay, Lord God, you are a perfect God. Your timing is faultless. Your creativeness is just amazing to behold. And you care for each one of us, the God of creation. You care for each one of us. 
And you're a big enough God that you can do that. And we want to thank you for that tonight. We want to thank you that it was your plan that began this whole story, that began this whole project. And that you're the God of individuals. You want that relationship with each one of us. So we thank you that you're not some God somewhere stuck up in heaven that has, is not touched by where we're at today, but that you know us, each one of us, individually. You know us so intimately. You know how many hairs are on each head in this room. So Lord God, we want to thank you for that. Continue to teach your people. Continue to teach us your perfection, your ways of seeing things. Because we know that you sit in reality and we need to find your reality for all of this. So Lord, continue to teach us, continue to share with us how you see human beings and how you see the need to work with our heart stuff, the need to let you touch our heart. So bless each person here tonight, Lord, in the way that they need to know where you are in their life. And Lord, the needs as we sit here, there are many needs in our group. And we just ask that you continue to open our eyes so we can see where you are in our life. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen.